Hello and welcome back to The Conversation with your host, me, Nadine Matheson. Now, I like to be, um, well, I like to be honest and upfront. And as I record this intro, it's the middle of March. It's pouring down with rain. It's windy. And it's been a very difficult few days for me as my cousin Charlene, she passed away a few days ago from cancer. And it just got me thinking because I've been in my thoughts a lot over the last few days. But it just got me thinking that maybe we don't talk openly enough about grief. But I can say that it's the most surreal experience that you can go through. And there's been moments where it's actually felt like an out-of-body experience. That's the best way that I can describe it. You know, on a looking at that, the happy times and the bright times. I know that my cousin Charlene, she would have loved, she would have loved to knowing that her name was being called out on the podcast. So there is that. And one of the things we always did, we always told each other, I love you. If you go on my Instagram um, feed, then you'll see there's a post talking about how we always told each other that I love you. So my advice to you, my little shout out, to everyone out there is tell those you love tell those you care about that you love them okay so moving on moving on to the conversation podcast today's guest is author tv producer and script writer simon toyne i had a fantastic time talking to simon and i know you're going to enjoy this episode a little fact about simon His debut novel, Sanctus, was the biggest selling debut when it was released back in 2011. Could you imagine the biggest selling debut? And I think in the podcast he says that so far it's been translated into 29 languages, sold in 50 countries. It's an international bestseller. It's crazy. But amongst other things, we talk about the skill of a storyteller, setting yourself a challenge, And what happens when you don't complete the challenge? And also, what happens when your plan doesn't go to plan? So as always, sit back or go for a walk and enjoy the conversation. Simon Toyne, welcome to the conversation. Well, thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here. (laughs) It's lovely to have you. So I have a um, a question for you because I was being very nosy on your website you know, going for the info, the about stalking. you section. It's called stalking. Was, there's, there's laws. I, you should know that. I know there are laws. <laughs> I don't call it stalking. Information <laughs> gathering. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> what I was doing. Um, and it said, <laughs> okay, mm. I like, okay, maybe stalking. We do, we'll call it stalking. Yeah, fine. You studied drama and English at Goldsmith University. I did. You did. And it's also said that you wanted to be an actor before you decided that you wanted to tell your own stories. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's <brother>. all correct. <laughs> uh, well, I my... think one well, the thing is, you know, when you go to, and it's funny because my my eldest child is nineteen, I'm about to go to university, so I'm sort of reliving all of that that stepping out into a wild, wider world thing that I did when I was the same age. Um, and that, that, you know, you sort of you don't really know much. You know, your entire life has been quite small. You lived at home and you've gone to school and you've got your friends and you've studied the subjects and the subjects are very you know clearly laid out for you in neat boxes of history and English and whatever um and I knew I loved I I read you know I was like all writers I read loads I was a real bookworm um and I was in school plays and I really enjoyed that storytelling thing I suppose of just sort of inhabiting a character and um you know, and also you know nothing when you're a teenager and you just think, well, no. that looks glamorous. <laughs> oh, I'll be an actor. That would be great. I'll just, you know, do that and win Oscars. And it's like that easy. Um, and so I – and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do at university, but, you know, you, you lean towards the things you're better at. And I was good at English. Yeah. So I did English. And then I saw that you could do English and drama. And when I did it, which was a long time ago now, there weren't that many uh, universities that did this kind of joint honours. I think there was Bristol, Liverpool – Warwick there were, um, goldsmiths and 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 you know there weren't many there were a handful that did English and drama as joint honors as a BA rather than you know a sort of a, a, an acting course or whatever 
So I thought, oh, well, that sounds good because I can do that. Because also, I didn't quite fancy the idea of three years of just reading books and writing essays, which yeah. I just thought was what English would be, which it would have been. Um, and I thought at least doing drama meant you'd do something, you'd get out of the house occasionally. Um, but I did. <laughs> I genuinely wanted to be an actor, but I think only because my only experience up to that point of doing something in that kind of area was being an actor you know i'd had i'd sort of directed a couple of things like little things sort of house competition plays at school um and it was and in my first year at uh, goldsmiths or practically in my first term i decided i really didn't want to be an actor um partly just because there were so many other interesting things to do you know because all of a sudden you go, I go to university and there's a proper theatre with a proper lighting board. And you know, they go, oh, you can do lighting, you can do sound, you can do set design, you can do all this. And I said, it's sort of, you know, you, my mind kind of suddenly exploded of, oh, there's so many different ways you can tell stories and be creative and communicate to an audience. Um and uh, and so and actually one of the, and then so as part of that, one of the modules I did was um, film and TV because I've always loved films as well. Mm. In fact, I started off my first writing really was writing scripts and writing short scripts and things and studying screenplays. And I wanted to be a director and, you know, I wanted to become a director uh, by writing my own stuff and directing my own stuff. Um, and then long story, I graduated and ended up writing a few scripts, really hard to get a script off the ground, made a few short films that were in like London Film Festival and things. Um, and ended up because I'd done all this stuff and had this sort of technical ability of telling stories visually, uh, uh getting jobs in TV largely because I needed to eat. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's all right writing a screenplay, but until it gets made, you don't get paid. Um, and the screenplay is only the beginning of something you then, you know, it's a blueprint, you know, that you then have to build the thing, you know, you have to kind of cast it and, um, get a DOP and get funds and locations and all, you know, they say you have to, the planets have to line up. It's really hard to make a film always has been. Um, and the writing part of it is just the beginning. Um, and so I ended up then sort of real struggling to, and not getting anything made apart from, and not sort of progressing. And so I, m my part-time jobs in TV where I'd sort of go and do a bit of a TV job and then, you know, earn enough money to then mm. spend some time writing or trying to get a film off the ground ended up you know the gaps between the tv jobs got smaller and smaller until yeah. hey i suddenly had a tv career <laughs> and so i worked in tv for 20 years at various capacities and then it was um it was only it was approaching my 40th birthday when i suddenly uh, you know i kind of had a mild midlife crisis of you know a, a, a sort of an assessment of where i was of like right well, i'm 40 i've got a tv career but quite a successful tv career but do i want to be doing is this it do i want to be doing this yeah. forever um and and that notion of wanting to tell a bigger story that i was in control of which is what you know writing and directing a film is had never left me and I'd, and even though i'd done lots of stuff in tv it's much more of a collective endeavor and i'd never done drama in tv either weirdly i'd just done really yeah i'd pretty much done everything else i didn't like tiny bits of drama but i'd never gone in that direction it's very it's tv's very um sort of feudal you know there's very distinct kingdoms you know there's documentaries and there's light entertainment and there's comedy and they all you know you end up sort of in a ghetto really and I never ended up in the drama ghetto um, just because of the nature of the jobs I took uh, and the career path I ended up on I made all sorts you know comedies documentaries lots of formatty stuff lots of makeover programs lots of travel programs did I did makeover programs yeah yeah that, I, was I never very... expected this <laughs> No, I know. There you go. You read my books. You, there's not a hint of decor in them or makeovers. But well, it was at a time you know, cast your mind back 15 years ago. Pretty much every other show was a makeover show. You know, an interior yeah. show. And so I worked in commercial television. So I made those shows. Um, you know when you you know when you're making the change. Now I call it the pivot. So yeah. you know when you pivoted at university and then you're in this TV world. And you're yeah. making, I think you're making multiple pivots. Was there any affair attached to that? Or you just, you just did it? You just went with it? Um, it was, I think, well, I was staff. So basically I, I, got, I took a staff job um, when my first child was born, just because I needed the security and, you know, holiday pay and all that kind of stuff. And I'd always resisted it because I sort of think you kind of need to be a bit scared creatively in order to do good work you know if you, as soon as you start to feel comfortable it's you know it's hard to 
you need to be doing things that are challenging so anyway um for for kind of practical reasons i took a staff job um and worked for four and a half years doing this staff job but of course the, the you know the, the good thing of that is you do get your holiday pay and paid every week or a month, month yeah. or whatever and all that sort of stuff and security you know i'm not constantly because if you're a freelancer which is what a lot of um creative stuff is is you know whilst you're doing a job you're also having to find the next job you know so you've got that yeah. insecurity of i'm doing this work but it ends next Friday and I don't know what I'm doing the following Monday. Um, and so it was good to have the security of that. But the, the downside of that is then you are owned by a company and they own your ideas and they tell you what they want you to do. You know, it's like, hey, we've got a commission for another makeover show, a bit similar to that one <laughs> we've already done. And we know you can do those. So you're doing it. And you're like, oh, great. That's boring and <laughs> really unchallenging. And I know exactly what to do, but it's can't someone else, you know, can't let someone else do it. Um, and so I was a bit, you know, creatively unfulfilled. And, and my, my, so I had two children at this point, but neither of them were at school. And it occurred to me that it was probably a good time if I was going to make a shift, a pivot. It was a good time to do it while they were not at school. Because as soon as they yeah. go to school, you're locked into, you know, location, really. So we, so I quit my job. We saved a bit. I re we rented my our house out, our flat out in Brighton, and rented a place in France for six months because I decided that what I wanted, and so I could write a book, so I could you know try and write a book. Um, and I figured, um, well, two things. One, I wanted to write a book, not a screenplay, because a screenplay is just the beginning of something, and I knew how hard that was. And I don't, I've always read crime and thrillers and well, I'd read wild widely, but I loved thrillers. Um, and, and I kind of understood them because, um, narratively the structure of them is very similar to making commercial television, you know, in, in, in the sense that you, by commercial TV, I mean, you know, primetime TV, you know, when everyone sat there supposedly in the old days in front of the <laughs> telly, you know, not uh, moving, <laughs> not moving, watching something and you're, and everyone, you know, you're trying to appeal to as many people as possible, get the biggest audience possible. And if you're making, and if you're working for, you know, a commercial network, ITV or channel four or whatever, you also have to hold people over the break. So you, so it's all about building questions and hooks at the end of part and get answered. It's very similar to writing a thriller or a crime book in the mm -hmm. sense that you set up a big question at the beginning that is only going to be answered at the end. And you have these sort of little kind of, um, uh, sort of hooks that pull you through the story that escalate along the way. Um, and so I kind of understood that and I thought I could write a thriller. I think I could, I understand the mechanics of writing a thriller and I know I could produce something because, you know, working in TV, um, I'd been working in a creative industry where you are required to be creative. So I knew I wouldn't get writer's block and stare out the window and whatever. Cause I, you know, I'd got the discipline of just turning up and producing something, even if it's rubbish, because yeah. knowing that you can fix it, which I think was a good discipline. Um, and I, um, and so I thought, right, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to give myself six months uh, to try and write something. And either it will be okay, which will be great, or it will be terrible, but at least I'll know. You know, at least I'll know. I'll have got it out of my system one way or the other. And the France bit was, hey, we can do this because the kids are young. And if I fail... Then I don't have to go. Oh, remember that six months where I sat in the spare room in my pants writing that <laughs> you terrible <made> book? Fart. <laughs> I go. Do you remember that six months we had a brilliant adventure in France? Wasn't that great? So I was sort of future, future proofing my own failure. I think. I love it. But did you have a plan for what would happen past the six months? So whether or not you had completed the book or had or had yeah had or haven't completed the book, like, uh, did you yeah. know what the next step was going to be? Uh, yeah. Well, I knew. I mean, everyone says, "Oh." break it wasn't really because the thing is i'd sort of i knew tv was a was, is a freelance industry so i knew i could get a job i knew i could get another job somewhere uh i knew that i didn't want to stay at the company i was at because i, I didn't like the, the programs they were making i didn't or i didn't like the programs i was making for them so i knew i needed creatively to do something and i was miserable so i needed to do something um and so i figured i could write the book and and my plan i had a, like a five-year three book plan I figured from the beginning, from yeah, yeah. You, yeah, 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 because I and I thought I can always I can always get jobs when we run out of money because I because you know there's so much 
TV been made in in the UK and 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 you know and I had I knew lots of people because I yeah. had a twenty year career so I had the contacts I had the CV so I, I you know I knew I could get work so it wasn't that much of a risk I knew we won't be out we wouldn't be out on the street um, and I figured I. I I figured what I wanted to do as well. And also my kids were young and I just sort of, my when my son was born, I was executive producing a big live show. So I couldn't have any time off because it was live. You know, I couldn't mm-hmm. go, oh yeah, my, I've just, I kind of just have a week off to, you know, spend time with my newborn son and look after my wife. And it was like, no, because you're on air on Thursday. And it's like, oh, and I just thought, I hate that. I hate the fact that I'm not really in control of my own life. Yeah. So I figured what I was going to try and do, my plan was to be able to, um, after give myself five years and pr- probably three books. And I figured the first book would be terrible. And well, it wouldn't be terrible, but I'd kind of figure out how to write a book and I'd get, you know, I'd sort of learn a lot doing it. And maybe I'd queer, queer, and I thought I could query that with agents and maybe get an agent interested who would then give me guidance on what to write the second one on and how to write it better. I figured maybe the second one might get me an agent. And the third one I was hoping might get published. So that was my plan. And if that didn't happen within five years, at least I'd have written three books. We, would, You know, I'd have carried on doing TV and I, I would have got it out of my system one way or another. Yeah. And then I could, you know, just I was going to say, you know, it's really interesting. Is that, you know, if most people had a free book plan, if they're sitting down, I'm going to, you know, take this six months sabbatical, six months break, I'm going to write. I have a free, month, a free book plan. Their free book plan wouldn't be a case of, my my progression as a writer, if you know what I mean, it'll just be mm. this is the first book in the series. This is the second book. It wouldn't be well. This is the first book to get me an agent. This is the second book, which we'll see. You know, hopefully it will get better. And the third mm-hmm. book is the one that will get published. Well, it, that was based on research. You know, I just looked at stuff, and you know, from I mean, there weren't all when I so this was nearly 15 years ago now so there was you know hard there wasn't that much really available right. um online or anything you know and what there was I found and I looked at it you know interviews with authors um and uh articles about writing all this kind of stuff and and from that research it just it seemed to me that the 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 pro- that was that was basically the progression you know you write a first book and it's terrible but you you <laughs> get it out of your system and you learn tons doing it your second book is better and possibly you know a near miss but interesting enough to get you through the door of maybe representation or yeah. publisher or whatever and then the third one's when you hit your stride um most people seem to have a couple of books in in their drawers you know or at least one that they go oh, I wrote this book it was terrible you know but I learned loads um I couldn't have written the second book without that you know whatever yeah and so I just thought you know sort of I was just managing my expectations I suppose and not going right I'm just going to write a bestseller I'm going <laughs> to quit this job and write a bestseller I'm just going to do that you know because you know I was being realistic and also I came from the world of commercial tv you know and I'd worked in uh, so I and part of that, my my last job was as development producer, which basically was coming up with ideas, pitching them to broadcasters, and mostly getting rejected. So I kind of understood the process of like, mm. you know, does it might be you might think it's the best idea ever, but if it doesn't fit the market, I understood the market, I suppose. Right, and how, you hadn't and how romanticized it. No, I kind of knew it as a, and I suppose I'd spent twenty years as a creative in a commercial, you know, where where creativity. Uh, you know, combined with com- with the commercial sector, and so I understood. I understood that you had to have two hats. You had to have your creative head in order to kind of make something and make it as good as you mm. can with all the craft that you bring to it. But as soon as it's finished, it's a commodity that you then need to sell in order to make a living at it. I mean, that's the thing, and and that was you know what I was doing. I thought I need to make a living at this. I can't just write a book that that I like doing for my you know and some navel gazy thing that that. <laughs> <laughs> that I like doing, but I, you know, sort of. It not doesn't pay the bills. No, exactly. That <laughs> I've got no chance of selling any copies. So I deliberately sort of set out to write a thriller, partly because I, I you know, from research, I, I knew that was one of the biggest uh, market areas. You know, that and romance, and I didn't really fancy romance. I thought I'm more of a thriller <laughs> guy, um, and um, and so and I and and again, you know, having read lots of thrillers, I could sort of see. I could see the stroke. And also, you know, again, through my TV job, a lot of what I did, because the broadcasters are always going, we want the new thing. Bring us the new thing. We want the new, exciting thing. And then when you come up with loads of very new original ideas, they're terrified. And what they really want is something a bit similar 
something that's already doing well. And so what you get very good at in developing in, as a development producer is watching Bake Off or whatever and <laughs> pulling it apart and going, right, how's this the elements of this? How would you make this? What are the beats of this? Even what are the shots of this? You know, you start off with a wide drone of the tent and then you move into the tent and the voiceovers and, you know, you really pull it apart in that way. Yeah. And so when I was writing my first book, I did it. I approached it in exactly the same way. I had an idea when I was in France and I thought about books I'd read previously that uh, similar elements to the book I was writing either thematically or just in terms of technical, you know, like I knew I had, there were action scenes. So I thought, what book have I read that had really good action scenes that I remember really kind of being impressed by the action or remember, you know, the action was memorable. And I reread those books, but I did it forensically. You know, I literally counted words. Yeah, of like analyzed how many it. Words. Yeah, analyzed it and pulled it apart and went, okay, this is – this is technically what is going on in that book that I read as a reader and was in, and was carried transported by the story. Now I want to look at how they did that, you know, and now I want to sort of, you know, it's almost like the behind the scenes making yeah. of thing I wanted to do. And I did, but I did it very deliberately because I thought, okay, like my first book Sanctus is sort of set in um, a monastery. Um, and so I needed, I, I thought, right. So I reread the name of the Rose which is all set in a monastery. I mean, that's a yeah. medieval monastery. Mine's a modern monastery, but it's very medieval in its setting. And I just kind of went through that and thought, yeah, that, you know, I kind of felt like I learned a lot about the inner workings of a monastery without it being boring. How did they do that? How did he do that? Um, and so I kind of looked at it and kind of figured out that, that basically, you know, stuff like rather than just have a chapter saying, right, let me tell you how a monastery works. <laughs> and now we've got that clear. Back to the story. It's like, no, you have someone walking well, in that case, what you have is is the acolyte, the young the young guy who in the film was played by Christian Slater. Christian Slater, um, I know. Christian Slater, <laughs> first funny. role, I think. Anyway, um, um, and so it's great. And you have, you know, you have um, um, Henry of Baskerville, Sean Connery, uh, mm. walking through, explaining, showing, and explaining how it works. Right. But as he's going yeah. to see someone, you know, so it's action. It's you it's, it's, it's turn into something that's that's active. And so it's little things like that. I just thought, oh, that's how you do it. What you do is 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 it's necessary, but it's secondary to the story. Something is always yeah. happening and things like that. And that's just one example. And I just did that. And I kind of recommend that when people kind of go, oh, you know, how do you improve your craft? And I still do it now with every new book. I'll kind of go, okay, this is set here. This is the theme. What book have I read that's similar to that? Uh, normally, the first one you think of is obviously a very good one because you've read it, and then I just get it, and then I'll sort of reread it. It's, really it's a very, it. it's a very legal way of working on a book in terms of how I'll analyze a case as a as a lawyer. I have a this full package, and then what you're then doing, you're breaking it down bit by bit by bit by bit by bit to see, you know, what's making up the offence, where, where's your client's defence, what, you know, what are the witnesses saying? You're continuously breaking it down. And when you're going through an interview um, transcript with your, with your, that your client's given, you're constantly breaking down. So it's a very analytical way. I say a legal analytical way of um, doing but it's, it. But, but I imagine, you know, in, in what you do as well is is you're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to find the story, aren't you? You're trying yeah, to find – and, and, and also you're trying to simplify the story because, you know, like if you're in front of a jury, you need to simplify often quite a lot of dense stuff into a yeah. clear narrative that they can grasp quickly without glazing yeah. over. And really that's all we're doing as writers or any yeah. creative as well is you take the story and you try and – you tell it in the most – engaging way and you just don't try you try not to bore the reader by putting stuff in that they don't need to know you know and that's that's editing really but like yeah it's um and it's the same it was the same in tv you know it's the same in anything i mean i was just sort of say it's always it's all storytelling and people go oh it's amazing you, you came from tv and now you're a novelist whatever and it's i was like but it's all the same it's you know at its base level it's storytelling and it's i'm sure it's the same for you as well it's like you know, I'm, I'm the good barristers are just great storytellers. You know, they are. I'm like, I'm, I mean, I teach, I was going to say, when I teach the, I call them the baby lawyers, one day they're going to get annoyed at me. But when, when <laughs> I teach the baby lawyers and I teach them about closing speeches and I always say to them, you're continuously telling a story. And as you said earlier, I'm simplifying that story for the jury to keep them interested. You want them to get to the hook because the hook and the end of it is that I need you to equip my client so it's all storytelling even when you're cross-examining someone you know you, there has to be a beginning middle and end you have, there has to be a build-up 
to your cross-examination till you know, you finally hook them in at the end. So, yeah, it's exactly... Uh, no, I see, but it's the same techniques. And actually, if you think about it, as you know, what it does is, is it shows that we, as, a, as an, am, an animal, as a species, you know, if you think about, you know, why we're successful, you know, we're not the fastest, the strongest, the tallest, the, you know, able to cope with cold temperatures. You know, we're actually quite a, a sort of weedy little creature. Basic. Sort of pretty basic. <laughs> But what we're really good at is communicating, and so what that means is we we can we can pool the knowledge. It's not like every generation starts from scratch. You know, we build, mm. we stand on the shoulders of all the learning that's gone before. And the way that happens is through storytelling. All of it is storytelling. The way we communicate everything that human humans have ever learned or experienced is through stories and so it's the glue that kind of it's the thing it's our superpower really you know it's the thing that sets us apart from everything else you know you don't need to you know sort of figure out how to kill a stalk a deer kill it skin it eat whatever someone will tell you the story of how to do that and you will go oh and then you have that knowledge you know you don't need to have to you know go through it all you know and we and and so and I think so like what well, you know which is why it's always interesting I think in any kind of communicative uh, area whether it's um, you know the legal profession or or PR or communications or filmmaking or writing or whatever or music even it's you know it's what what you're doing is you're making a connection you're telling a story and it sort yeah. of you know it combines us and that's some I think that's you know that's something that's very um, it's universal and it's fundamental to who we are as, as an animal. And that's why I think, you know, it's sort of, you know, we all love gravitate to, towards stories and yeah. good storytellers. So are you were saying, am I from a big family? You know, I'm not from a big family. Are you from a creative family or was it or from an academic professional? Family? No, my, like so, uh, no, not at all. I don't know where it comes from. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's slightly baffling. I mean, my dad's always wanted to be a writer. Like, but he, he was sort of worked in business you know, he was a business person mm. and um, and he always wrote stories. And I think, you know, he kind of like always wanted to be a writer, but he sort of, I, I don't know. Well, he didn't have a great education. You know, he sort of, you know, he's a smart guy, but he, he very much was, you know, worked his way from the ground up in business and ended up, you know, sort of owning a business and doing all that kind of thing. Um, and he reads a lot and everything, but and, uh, yeah, he always likes writers. And so maybe that's where my ambition came from but like I don't my ability to tell stories I, I'm not you know because I mean I don't I don't like he writes but he never edits it's, <laughs> it's, it's the point where I can't way. actually read anything he and he's retired now and he and occasionally he'll sort of throw me some stories and goes oh I have a, and, and the thing is like I he, he wrote he retired and he wrote a novel and he gave it to me to read this is before I was a novelist and um but I was working in tv you know where you have to be yeah. you know you still this br- brutal with your editing and everything and I gave him an honest appraisal of what needed to go which was most of it and what I thought the main story was and how everything it was three stories in one really and I was like right you need to just get rid of these two stories and it was 200 and odd thousand words long and I was like it's just too long wow. there's three stories and I said you just need to like focus on this and just and get rid of all that. There's loads of, you know, every character you meet has a backstory. You don't need that and whatever. And he was so like, um, offended. I, I, I'm offended. I hope not offended. <laughs> I think he was, I think he was so shocked by the amount of at work that I was suggesting. And may, and I, maybe he just didn't trust me. Um, <laughs> although my sister who does work in publishing, read it and said the same thing and I uh, and I think and so but he never so then and he never edits I think he and enjoy- which is fine you know he likes writing um, he just wants he likes to write stories and then and then they're done and he doesn't want to go back and pick them apart and do second third and fourth drafts and that's that's totally fine you know that's totally fine you know you, you don't necessarily have to it's like if you go for a run you don't necessarily have to go right next to marathon when next to the Olympic. Not- you know I'm what not I mean? Doing any of that? No, exactly. No, but I'm, you know, I'm just saying it's like there's levels of doing it. You yeah, know, I, play, I play tennis, but I'm never gonna. Like, I'm not like right. I need to get a coat, do all it. You know, it's like it's you do it at a level and you enjoy it, and that's fine. And it's the same with writing. I think I think the thing with writing is because everyone can write. Technically, mm. they can physically write. They think everyone thinks they've got a book in them, but like very, few, I, genuinely, very few people actually have a good book in them. I don't think just because no, some. Just- people, 
just but the a they lack the discipline and don't even understand how hard it is to get a finished publishable book and how much work is involved uh, and also i think a lot of people just aren't very good storytellers naturally they're just not you know you either are or you're not yeah it's not their yeah. skill set <laughs> no <laughs> exactly and you can teach you can teach some of it but like if you inherit Good storytellers inherently know how to tell a story. They know yeah. what information to give you and and in the right and what order to dramatize anything. You know, yeah. you've got we all know someone who who can, you know, tell the story of returning a cardigan to Marks and Spencer's and you're rolling around <laughs> laughing and it's like and you just it's a great story. And I'm someone just... else can tell you the story of that time they were kidnapped and you are glazing over <laughs> thinking about what you're gonna have to tell you. Because they just can't tell a story. It's not the subject matter. It's the storyteller. And the, it's and the it's, storyteller. You know. It reminds me of my niece. Um, when she's about, gosh, she would have been about six or seven. And she was a great storyteller. And she was with me. I think it was Christmas. No, it was New Year's Eve. Or not, no, the day before New Year's Eve. So she was with me with my other god children. And they're upstairs. She's in my makeup. I know they're in my makeup. She comes downstairs. I covered with eyeshadow. And then proceeds to embark on this five minute story about how she's not been in the makeup. But she's such a good storyteller that, you know, she and she just naturally knows the beats to hit. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And she's yeah. convincing with it. So you just end up just like, you know, I'm actually falling for this. But I can see well, just, the evidence the is, in you my just, eyes. You just, you're, going, you're happy to go along for the ride, aren't you? You're like, I don't yeah, believe a word of this, ride. but I just want to see where it's going. Yeah, I'm, I'm in. Yeah, no, and other people, you're just like, oh, what was it again? What were they saying the, about the kidnappers? I've forgotten. Were they kidnapped? <laughs> no, I zoned out in the middle of that. And it's weird. It's very, it's, it's an interesting thing. But yeah, but I yeah. think it's, but again, in this, you know, in the same way that some people are like really sporty, just naturally, or tall, you know, it's a natural. You are, you have different attributes. Everyone has different ones, and it's like, you know, it's not everyone's right to be able to write a book. And no. I think a lot of people feel that they have the right to write a book and the, you must read it. And I, but I just sort of think, <laughs> I think, you know, you sort of, well, as from my side of things, as a writer, I, I'm very respectful of the reader. And, you know, I know that if they pick up my book and, and read it, that's like eight hours of their life that they are committing to something, to a story mm-hmm. that I've chosen to tell them. And so I owe it to them to make it a good one and work as hard as possible to make it as good as I can make yeah. it. You know, I sort of, you know, I, I kind of feel very, there's a real responsibility, I think. Um, particularly, just, you know, when once you write more books and you get a readership who, who are quite loyal and, you know, will read anything that you write and go, oh, you know, you get messages on Facebook and whatever going, when's your next book out? And, you know, I, and they're the ones I'm like, I, I really owe it to them to when I'm struggling like I, like I am at the moment, you know, you kind of go, right, I know, I know, I could just, just sort of go, oh, when this happened, or no, no, no I need to work on this, you know, because I owe it to the reader, I think. Yeah, you have a com- you create a community and you have a responsibility to that community. Absolutely, um, I, yeah. I was just thinking of like, you know, when we was talking about, you know, you play tennis or you're a runner, but you don't, you're not saying you're going to run the, um, the marathon next week. And I'm like, I always like to think of myself as a gamer, but the reality is like, I couldn't get my Batmobile off the roof for six months and I lost my horse in Red, Head, <laughs> in Red Dead Kid Redemption 2. I, like, I lost it in the snow. Lost it. Somewhere there. <laughs> like, my brother's like, just whistle. And I'm like, I don't even know how to whistle on this thing. But, you know, so, you know, so you've done yourself, you did your seven months, you know, you've set, not this seven months, you did your six months, you've set this challenge for yourself. When you didn't, com- you hadn't, you didn't complete your book at the end of the initial no, so I no, experience. So I set off and I thought, right, I'm going to write something that doesn't require any research because six months is like is not it's it's a d- decent amount of time. But I, you know, I didn't want to just be writing six months. I did want to be having a bit of a French adventure with my young family as well. Yeah. Um, and I thought I don't want to just burn up a lot of that time researching something. Um, so I so I had a couple of ideas that were very sort of Harlan Coben esque, sort of you know ordinary man thrown into extraordinary circumstances, um, thriller type ideas. You know, one was about and and it was you know using what I knew. So one was about an idea about a, a TV producer making a a kind of documentary uh, who's going through the rushes and thinks he's witnessed a murder. You know, uh, which was a sort of a version of you know the film Blow Up. And that, but like done in a modern way with sort of you know as a 
through the lens of a kind of TV producer. And then it turns out that he has. And so obviously people are trying to shut him up and get hold of these rushes and he's on the run. And so I thought, oh, you know, that's that feels good. And it feels like a world I know. So, so yes, yeah, so back to my Harlan Coburn-esque um, idea of uh, the, the, the TV producer. So I started thinking about that. Um, and then, and so the story was basically uh, my wife and I were driving to this rented house in the South of France. Uh, mm-hmm. I had, we had this van, I, we, this old van that we bought um, and she was in our car and it was full of, stuff to make our this place we'd rented look less like a rental and more like our home and mostly full of kids stuff you know toys and stuff because my my son was one and my daughter was three um and um so we drove and the idea was then uh my mum and dad were going to fly out the next day with them by which time we would have drew because it's an eight hour drive down to this house so uh we were going to get there make the house all you know fill it full of um, you know, familiar things. Make it light, toys. alive. Make it, make it our home rather than just some weird yeah. place. Uh, and then they were going to go. So anyway, so we'd set off on the midnight ferry, and this is November, um, and there's a storm in the channel, and we're there. Oh. And my wife, who, you know, is like, oh, they're going to cancel the ferry. They're going to cancel the ferry. They did not cancel the ferry. <sighs> we got on the ferry, and it's um, and it's a weird for the New Haven to Dieppe ferry. It's a four-hour crossing, and it's mostly full of truckers. And so we we got on and it, we came out of the harbour and, and, and it sort of backs out of New Haven and turns round. And as it turned around, it got hit by like, it was like the Poseidon adventure, this wave and the oh whole God. ship lurched and everything in duty free broke. You could hear this smashing. And then there was this smell of, you know, whiskey mixed with all the perfume <laughs> that kind of drifted through. And uh, and there was just like lorry drivers throwing up all around. It was just horrendous. So that was our crossing. And the idea was we were going to sort of sleep on the ferry and get there early in the morning and then drive the eight hours down to our new house. Um, but we didn't sleep at all. We, you know, we were just like thinking we we're going to die any five uh, every yeah. five minutes. And uh, so we we landed in Dieppe, happy that we were still alive, and just immediately just drove inland looking for a hotel because we needed to sleep for a few hours before we made our journey. And as we drove uh, an hour uh, in land from Dieppe is Rouen um and and as we were driving in I saw the spire of Rouen Cathedral which is this very kind of needly like very strange almost like a hypodermic mm. needle spire and as I saw it and because of the the uh, because it was in Rouen this quote popped into my head that I'd read years ago and really liked uh, by Ralph Waldo Emerson uh, which is a man is a god in ruins and because of the plan words of Rouen and Rouen and the cathedral I suddenly thought, what if ruin was a place, and there was, and it was a place where where gods were, you know, ruined gods were, and whatever. And so we 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 found a hotel, slept for a few hours, and then I was in the, the my my very slow van right. driving yeah. downtown, and I just had this image and that quote in my head. And by the end of that journey, I had the seed of what turned out to be Sanctus, which is the book I did in start writing in France which was mm. so not the idea I wanted to write because it was big it was operatic it was multiple location it required tons of research but but the thing was it was the best idea it was absolutely the best idea it was, well, it was, it was. The idea. and and it was that I just thought I haven't read that book that's a really good idea yeah. And I was a bit scared of it. I was like, should I be doing that's like a third book? That's a lot going on in that. And you know, that's I'm not do your it. first book to practice with. It's not this my practice. Fir- it's not my nursery's book. book. <laughs> it's like putting and strapping on some skis and throwing yourself down a black yeah. line. It was just like, re- why do I want to do that? I'm just gonna crash and burn on this one. But in the end, I just it. thought, well, no, and I just thought, well, look, if I'm gonna fail doing this, I'd rather fail honestly. I'd rather fail really going for it. You know, because if I'm playing safe before I even start, what's the point? You know, because I think, again, creatively, you should do things that you're not sure you, you can do mm. and you are you should stretch yourself because yeah. that's – because, right, you know, being doing creative stuff is quite hard. And so there has to be some reward in it. And I think in the same way as people climb hard mountains, you know, I think doing something creatively that, that challenges you you know, on lots of levels, it should, should be what you're doing. So I thought, right, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to launch into this book and, and see what happens. And so I, in the end, my six months where I really thought I could end up with a rough first draft, I'd, I'd ended up written about 
about 150 pages, but I mapped it out and I'd done lots of research that I didn't want to do. And so then I came back <laughs> and then and then got a job back in TV to, you know, boost the bank balance, finished uh, and spent the next year in downtime whenever I had breaks, just finishing yeah. off this story. And that actually turned out, you know, my three book plan, that turned out to be Sanctus, which was my first book. So I got an agent off it. And it was mm. the biggest selling debut thriller of twenty of twenty eleven in the UK, trans twenty nine languages. So that thing that I said absolutely this is not going to be it was it. That's what I was going to say. It this became was the a big bestseller. Book. I know, which is, I know it was a huge book, yeah. And then it became a trilogy, and uh, and so yeah, that was you know launched my career. And that was you what know a that? lot of that was luck and timing. Yeah, you know, it what wasn't that entirely. Did to your brain? What does that do to it, your Well, mindset? it makes it really hard to write the second book because, you know, so I sold the first book and then got a three book deal. Um, and they were and they were like, so the first book when I finished it, so basically the Sanctus has got this big mystery at the heart of it, this thing called mm. the sacrament, which is this mythical relic that's housed in this monastery, which has now become a sort of tourist destination. Um, and um, and people don't know whether this thing's real or what it is, is you know, because no one's ever seen it. Well, the only people who've seen it are the monks who look after it. Yeah. And they go into this place, this citadel, which is this monastery on the top of a kind of tower, and they never leave. And that's how they've maintained the secret. No one ever comes out of the citadel. Um, but now we're in a modern age of, you know, sort of, of uh 24 hour news cycles and and the internet and all this kind of stuff so and and something happens that that makes people start wondering and um so basically a monk escapes makes the sign of the cross with his body and then falls to his death but he does so in a certain way that he falls outside of the jurisdiction of the he almost flies off with his thing. He <laughs> falls outside the jurisdiction of this citadel oh. which is a bit like kind of you know Vatican City and so because he's in the municipal bit of this quite modern city, touristy city, um, there's an autopsy and they find things in his stomach that he's swallowed, including a piece of leather number on it. And they think initially, oh, it must be some sort of, you know, Bible verse. And then they realize, no, it's a phone number. So they ring it. And the person who answers is an investigative journalist in New York, a New Jersey, uh, who realizes that this person who fell from the top this monk is her brother who disappeared eight years earlier so she comes to try and find out what happened to him and of course in the course of that ends up finding out what the citadel is uh, what the sacrament is which is a big reveal mm. and that's the story the thing is you find out what the sacrament is soon you find out what this big mystery is the book's over so my epilogue was three pages of oh, well, he didn't die, he's <laughs> fine, whatever. And so when I sold the book in the end, they said, we love the story, it's great, we hate the ending, what do you want to write next? And, and so in the end, I said, well, I could rewrite the ending so it's a hook. So rather than a one-year-later thing, it's we see what happens as a result of this thing being mm. revealed and the ramifications of all that. But then when I looked at it, I kind of realised that that was going to be a massive second book, so I broke it in two and it became a trilogy. But in answer to your question, the trouble is then the first book comes out and is this huge hit and I'm writing the second book. So my second book, uh, while well, I'm struggling because, uh, you know, I've had 40 years of stuff put in the first book and now I've got a year basically to write the second one while my first book's doing really well. And I'm just, it was terrifying. I was just thinking, you know, oh, no, but I put, I put everything in that first book. I've got nothing. Left. I can't do it again. I can't it's do like it again. Empty. <laughs> yeah. Can't we just can't we just call it a day? Can't we just call it chalk that one up as a win and. You know, go and have it's, a like tea. it's like I've linked really from hard. my plan. I've done number three. <laughs> like I'm done. Yeah, now. yeah. And it, and plan. Ultimately, yes, and it, ultimately, but the thing is, ultimately, the, you know, you have that's the thing about being a writer or a professional writer is, you know, you you do have to do it again. You put everything mm. you can into one book, and you you finish it, and you start another one, and you know, that's, you did it again. With, yeah, you did it again with Solomon Creed. Well, Solomon Creed was yes. Yeah, so the trilogy finished, and then Solomon Creed came out, and that was just the start of a new series um um and that and that was just an idea that i'd had sort of knocking around for a while of a, a sort of episodic story following a character who's trying to find out who he is you know he's yeah. he's someone who knows everything about everything but nothing about himself and so he's sort of he has a few clues and he follows them and he, he goes to these places trying to find out 
if anyone knows him there and gets into all kinds of bother, um, you know, because he's asking questions in places where they don't want questions asked. Mm. And and he sort of discovers skills that he has and he has no idea how he knows them. You know, he can speak languages and he sort of just got that encyclopedic knowledge of everything. Um, and so I just liked the idea of a, of a story structure where I could take him anywhere. You know, the first yeah. one start, is in Arizona and the second one is in France. And the third one, which I started writing and then had to abandon because it had a pandemic kind of plot <laughs> and then an actual pandemic happened. And I was like, this book feels like weird now. So I, yeah. so I kind of paused it. Um, was The next one was going to be in England and America again. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it was a good – and I'll finish – I will finish it, um, but I just sort of stalled with it and – and then ended up, and I had this other idea that my publisher said, well, well, you know, why don't you write that one instead? Which turned out to be Dark Objects, which was the book. I was going to ask about year. that. Yeah, because yeah. I saw, you know, I saw you last year talking about Dark Objects. And you seemed so passionate about the story and the house. That oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, well, it yeah. was, yeah, so the story was, well, yeah, because we met on a panel and it was, um, and, and when the book was just coming out. And the thing was, it was normally, like in previous, one of the sort of perks of being a writer or writing the books I do is I've always kind of gone, where would I like to set a book? Where's a good dramatic location? Mm -hmm. So like Solomon Creed was set in Arizona in the desert. I needed a desert location. And I liked that sort of kind of elemental setting. Um, and so I went to Arizona for a couple of weeks and just kicked about the desert and interviewed policemen and, you know, walked around and smelt the desert in the rain and all that sort of stuff, which all kind of filtered into the book. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, I think you, you should be when you're writing something you need to know it well you need to know yeah. what we're talking about so yeah so i so i always do that and then um the second book boy who saw is set in um the south of france uh which is where the area where i went to to write sanctus so i knew that area worked really well and actually um we've got a house there now quite grandly and um <laughs> We uh, where I go to often start and finish books. In fact, I'm going there later today. Um, oh, are you? To put in a shower. It's not that glamorous. Um, <laughs> and um, so I know it really well. So I sort of I kind of wanted to put all that into that book. And then, but then lockdown happened, which A, killed Solomon Three because it had a pandemic plot that Same fell out mm. of time. And also I then couldn't go anywhere and research anything. So... So I wrote Dark Objects set in North London where I used to live because I didn't need to research it or go there because I knew it already. And so that yeah. that sort of came out of that. And also it was it was weird because I just I almost sort of thought it's the Dark Objects was my first was my fifth no, no my hang on sixth novel and uh but it was my first one set in the UK. All the rest have been set everywhere else. And I yeah. think and it took me that long, I think, to almost to I think have the confidence in my abilities to make something that was very familiar to me dramatic. I think suppose previously, you can, I suppose you yeah. can detach yourself from something that's not set where you live and where you, what an area that you know. You see, I find it easier writing about stuff that I don't know that well. Because yeah. I think naturally a place like Arizona is, it feels just inherently exotic. And dramatic and interesting. Mm -hmm. You don't know anything about it. I'm sure if you lived there, you'd go, oh, it's really boring and it's really hot in the summer. And, you know, it's just like, there's no green. Yeah, one of my, cousin, you know, one of my cousins lives there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I love it. I love Arizona. I think it's a beautiful, mental sort of place. It's so beautiful and stark. And partly, I think, just because I've grown up in England, which is very green and very different. Yeah. Whereas, you know, and I think probably if you lived in Arizona, somewhere like England would seem very exotic because it's so alien. You know, all everything is different. The plants mm. are different. The animals are different. Um, and so I sort of found it hard it kind of in pro in prospect before when I was writing my first books to sort of even consider setting something in the UK because I just thought it's so familiar to me. How am I going to make that interesting? How am I going to do yeah. that? Um, and also, I just wanted to do something. You know, I mean, a big part of it, I think, as a writer, is you've got to write something that excites and interests you because yeah. you you surely will get bored of it during the process because it's such a slow process. So you need to have as much energy and enthusiasm yeah. for it at the beginning as you can to give you the impetus to get going enough to keep you going through the slog. It would be like that person telling a really bad story that we were talking about earlier. You know, you're sitting with yourself for so long. And if that storytelling is not entertaining, then, you know, how can you give 100% to it? 
Well, yeah, it's like telling yourself a joke that was initially funny, and then on the hundredth time, you're like, "That is that is the worst joke. That is why did they ever think that was funny?" But you've got to kind of keep going. You've got to keep the faith, and yeah. and you just trust that you know for everyone else. It's the first time they've heard it, and they will find it funny. Um, yeah, and it's so 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 yeah. So dark objects and it came out of the was my pandemic book, was my lockdown book, um, and it's set in North London where I used to live, and yeah, and and centers around this house which is a real house which is actually just went on the market or went on the market oh quite did recently. it yeah oh, i can be nosy and take a look at it then yeah no if you well on my facebook I, uh, page i link to it um oh, i'll do that <laughs> so if you've got a spare eight and a half million quid that house could be yours. Oh, co- oh, yeah. of course i do yeah we've all got that <laughs> just look down we've all got that knocking about <laughs> so what are you down. working on now are you working on the last um chapter of solomon creed or are you working on like a standalone uh, no I'm thinking about I think no, late to the second half of this year I plan to finish off Solomon 3 so I'll, I've got because I've got a new idea for the engine of that so I of the narrative engine so I think I just need to go through and reread it and I need mm. to um get rid of all the virus stuff and put the new thing in and just finish that off. Cause I just get lo- loads of people constantly contact me going, when's, th- where's Solomon? Where's the next Solomon book? They're waiting. I saw you had a new one and I was <laughs> like, you know, I've read it. I really like dark objects, but it was, you know, I was slightly disappointed. It wasn't Solomon book. And so, <laughs> so I, so there's that, you know, going back to that kind of, you know, sort of responsibility to the reader. Um, I, I will go back to Solomon. Um, but um, the two central characters of dark objects who are Lawton Reese, who's a criminologist academic who gets sucked into this case in this house in, in Highgate. Um, and uh, the metropolitan detective that she works with, Tannehill Khan. Um, so Tannehill and Lawton, I, re- I really liked them as characters and lots of and the readers really liked them as characters as well. Mm. And there was a lot of, oh, I hope this is the start of a series. And I had another idea of, of a story that Lawton could do with Tannehill's help. So I wrote that. So that's coming out in July. So there's, so there's another Lawton Tannehill book already. It's all finished. And that's oh, coming cool. out. It's called The Clearing, set in the Forest of Dean, where women are disappearing. And Lawton's not having it. Uh, so she goes there to sort that out. Um, that's coming out in July. And I'm writing a third Solomon, uh, a third Lawton Tannehill book now. I'm about 40,000 words into that, uh, which will be next July's book. And then when I finish that, which will be in the next couple of months or first draft next couple of months, I, I'll start looking at Solomon three and finish that. Or Solomon ever- four and a half, four, because <laughs> I wrote a novella as well. There's a Solomon oh novella. God. Do you ever just have like a singular idea? Just a standalone? And just, I'm just going to write one. That's the one story. That's complete. Well, yeah, every you- single Every single time, I think it's a standalone. Like Sanctus was supposed to be a standalone because I, you know, bearing in mind in my three book deal, there's no point in going right. I'm going to write three books. And my third book, which is the one I thought might get published, is the third book of a trilogy, and no one's read first or what, first or second. Yeah. So Sanct- Sanctus was absolutely supposed to be a standalone story, and it just turned into a trilogy just because they, ha- you know, Harper Collins hated the ending and thought it was all too <laughs> abrupt. And then I thought about exp- how to expand it, and it turned into two more books. Um, and then after the success of that, they kind of wanted another series. Um, and I also quite liked, I liked the element of having returning characters because yeah. it was sort of, it made each book different and sort of more interesting to me because it's like, right now, where can I take this character next? How can we, we can find out a bit more about them? Because always I think with a series character, you're, you've got, you've got three stories going on, really. You've got the present mystery, whatever's driving the story. Mm. You've got the future of where they're heading, you know. Are they going to get married? Are they going to move? Are they going to yeah. take that job? You know, which is something we all respond to. And also you've got the past because normally there's something in their past that drives them and makes them, you know, and you find out through flashback or through meeting people who knew them and hints at other stories, you know, what happened beforehand. And, I, and that's quite interesting as a writer to sort of, you know, hold those three threads as you're moving forward. And it kind of keeps it fresh, I think. Mm. Um because creating characters is really hard, and like you know, you create a really good, char- really great characters, great villains. You really work on them, and then if they're all in a self-contained book, that's it. You never see them again. No, um, that's true. And it's kind of it feels a sort of bit dispiriting. So anyway, after the so the Sanctus trilogy I, I, with Solomon, I just wanted to write a series, and so it, it was very. The initial idea was it was loosely based on the Ten Commandments. So there are going to be ten books, and each book kind of thematically is very loosely linked to one of the commandments. Um, 
and and the idea is that he has to sort of save someone's soul of in inverted commas um yeah. by observing this commandment or putting right something that 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 has been uh kind of tr- you know transgressed uh, in whatever the story is and at the end of the book once he's done that and learned that lesson solomon um he learns a bit more about himself which then takes him to the next one so it's almost like right. he's on a sort of it's like he's on a pilgrimage really pilgrimage i was gonna say yeah yeah it's very much like, uh, yeah, yeah that was the idea before i go on to like the four questions do you have you ever got overwhelmed by the enormity of it all or is it or it just that's what just drives you and motivates you I've never been overwhelmed. I, I feel sometimes weighed down by it. You know, like normally in the middle of a book, I kind of once you because starting books is fun because you go, it's all everything's to play for. You know, you've just got yeah. this kind of like you know the horizon to head for. And you normally, I mean, I normally know the ending of a book, and I sort of then figure out a good place to begin it. And I've got vague notions of where it needs to go in the middle, but mm. not not. I don't plan in great detail. In fact, the more the more the more books I write, the less I plan. Um, you think that's just experience? I think, yeah, confidence as well, and just sort yeah. of trusting the process. And also I just sort of hate plotting because it's really boring. <laughs> well, you sit See, there I and like, you just... I like just, to plan. I like planning. That's my, like, favourite bit. But, uh, yeah, but but also because you because you have a big other job as well. And um, and, yeah. and I think, I think, and I know lots of writers who have big other jobs and they, I think you need to plan because when you snatch those moments to write, you need to kind of hit the ground running. Yeah. You know, and I've, I've got more of the luxury as, because, you know, I'm, I just write. I mean, I still do TV stuff, but like it, you know, just as a sort of side hustle really and it's your little hustle now it's my little side <laughs> yeah it's my circle. side hustle again yeah yeah and then that's just because it's quite nice you know working i just write scripts for things you know and i sort of mm. and I, it's nice to just work work with another editor you know someone in a room for six weeks that, that and at the end of that six weeks you're, you've made a program and it's finished and you'd have to think about yeah. it ever again and it's not all on you you know that's that's quite good because you know going back to what you said about the overwhelming it is you know this it is all on you and you're a writer you know it's your idea you have to do it you have to sit there and get the words out you have to then make those words better you have to sort of do as best as you can do the work that you need to do research what you need to you know it's all on you you can't just delegate it you know it's all you're the one it has to filter through you because you're the author and you're the one telling the story so it is a lot of responsibility um and i think in the middle of a book normally once you've done that you've set it all up you know where it's going and now i'm in the middle and i'm just like it can kind of go in lots of directions but you also know that you have to then start focusing it back towards the end that's when it can be a bit sort of you know, you're like you're in a room full of spinning plates on canes, and you're like, "Oh, I need to do that one, and that one's about to crash." Yeah, there's and, a lot. Oh, whatever, <laughs> and you know, and you're just mad, and you're just thinking, and you just sort of, and also, I, I kind of become a bit weird in those. That period. <laughs> I, you know, well, do you, sat, how do you become weird? Well, like I'll be sat at the dinner table with everyone, and they're chatting away, and I just kind of zone out, and I'm thinking, <laughs> "No, no, his brother couldn't do that because if he, because that's it's like a." unless I rewrite his backstory in which case then that would be believable but then if I do that then that messes you know I'm just in my head I'm kind of like it's it's like the matrix they've got these green lines going down like this and uh everyone else is just chatting about whatever love island and then I'll suddenly zone in and I'll I'll realize that someone's asked me a question and I'm like huh and they go (laughs) you're just you're just not with us are you and I'm like no sorry I just yeah just murdering someone in my head and uh whatever (laughs) And it's, um, but I think, you know, once you're that deep in a book, it, it is fairly all consuming. You know, you do just think about yeah. it all the time. You do, you wake up. Go you to dream sleep. about it. I wake up. <laughs> you I often you wake, dream about it. Well, at that point, normally at that point, I wake up early. I start, I wake up at like four or five in the morning going, oh yeah, no, I need to do that. And then whatever. And I'll go, and I used to just lie there for two hours you know moving blocks of text around in my head or figuring it out and i've realized that is very matrix <laughs> and now what i do but now what i do is i just realize that i'm not going to go back to sleep so i just get up and actually do it and then, yeah so I, I, I get up with laptop go downstairs make a cup of tea let the dogs out and then <laughs> and then and then work and often i can get at that stage so which is sort of middle to the end of a book um I often get more done in that two hours, two or three hours before anyone else, you know, surfaces. 
do you have conversations with your character? I'm supposed to ask you these questions, but I will in a minute. But do you have? Yeah, no. I, yeah I have conversations, and I oh, find myself yeah. making two cups of tea and a coffee for these characters, and it's just me in the house. <laughs> I don't, well, I don't go as far as feeding them, but I do, my, <laughs> like, my kids will be, because I, the thing is, I work, I don't really have an, I used to have an office and I never went in it. So I decided when we moved, I was like, we don't, I don't need an office. I'm never going to use it. So I work all over the house. I'm currently in my daughter's bedroom, for example, because the light's nice from the window and, um, and it's away from everyone else. Um, but yeah. I work in my bedroom, the kitchen, there is a there is a desk downstairs in the living room. I can work on there. My son's got a desk in his room, so I work all over the place. Um, and so what happens? I'll be working away, and like my son, for example, will come home from school and will discover me in his bedroom, and he'll walk in and he'll go, "You're talking to yourself again," <laughs> and I have no idea. And I'll be there just going, well, you know, because I say a lot of stuff out loud, especially dialogue, but not always dialogue. Yeah. Sometimes I just say the di- you know, I'm not even aware that I'm doing it. I'll just be sort of testing words. It's testing words, really, and testing the rhythm. It's often the rhythm of things, you know, or, or and a lot of dialogue, yeah, and I'll sort of I'll act it out, it's, which goes back to the acting thing, you see. I think all writers are actors, really, on some Secretly, level. yeah. Well, yeah, because you have to inhabit you all of your characters. You know, you have to, you know, you have to kind of mentally think your way into... yeah. All of them, the good ones, the bad ones, everyone. You have to sort of inhabit them while you're writing them. Um, yeah. Otherwise... Also being, I was going to say, also being a lawyer, you know, you, you are acting. When I'm up, when you, you know, if I'm before a judge, I take on a certain role. When I'm before a jury, that role then switches. When I'm with the client, it switches again. So you're continuously inhabiting different roles. I'm never just Nadine. Mm, they, don't, just, they, don't, they, don't see, yeah, they don't see Nadine. But you weren't, but it's still you though, isn't it? And what it yeah, is is what, 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 what you 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 kind of amplify certain facets of your character yeah. depending on the situation. Definitely. Yeah, I know, and I think yeah. writers do that. You know, we're all actors to a degree. We're all kind of playing the part of ourselves. Yeah. Um, and just some some people are better at it than others. I know. I I got to see. <laughs> the drama really? teacher said you never saw me do anything, and I was quite <laughs> offended. <laughs> You th- maybe you were just being too subtle. That's what it was. I was. I was being too subtle. She wasn't getting the, you know, the full depth, the gravitas of my performance. You should have been more jazz hands. <laughs> I should have more. been. <laughs> and then you'd have got a better mark. A bit more Guaranteed, method. Should be guaranteed more method be with the jazz hands, yeah. <laughs> All right, Simon, I'm going to ask you your four questions. So the first one is, are you an introvert or extrovert or a hybrid of the two? Um, I think I'm a – well, my, my – my family would say I'm an introvert because I never go out and, and I sort of don't have many friends. Oh, no, no, but from choice, I sort of, um, I kind of, I've always been very self-contained. I'm very self-contained. You know, I'm very happy in my own company. I'm very happy on my own. I'm sort of, I kind of have never, I've always felt slightly uncomfortable in groups of people and stuff. Uh, when certainly when I was younger, you know, so I'm a bit of a loner in that respect. And so that sort of naturally kind of engenders a, a degree of introversion just because you you know mm. you don't want to necessarily go out and dance on tables and whatever having said that i'm also i'm i, I can be very, i'm also quite extroverted as well i'm like i'm for example like since becoming a writer or even before you know when i was doing presentations and things in tv um i was always very comfortable with it you know, very, yeah. I know and maybe that goes back to, you know, being an actor when I was young or acting at school and, you know, standing up on a stage in front of hundreds of people. I sort of, you know, I always kind of found it not that daunting. I mean, some people, mm. you know, kind of like it's their worst, worst nightmare, but I don't mind it. I've never minded it. I've never really got nervous about it. And I think it's an inherent thing because my kids have got it as well. They, yeah. they can happily stand up in front of anyone with unscripted and just talk to people, you know, just present something quite happily and they go it almost doesn't occur to them that they should be scared of it they just go oh no it's fine it's just a thing you know where someone else would be going green and thrown up in the corner yeah um so so like certainly as i've been become a writer and you know so the, the, there is part of the job is you go to festivals and you and i love it you know i love meeting readers and things and um and other writers like i met you uh, you know at um uh on uh, on on panels and things it's just really 
it's just it's nice to feel part because it's quite a solitary endeavor writing and so it's nice to feel part of a of a community and it's nice to just talk shop a bit as well you know with people who understand yeah you know where you you talk talk about what you know the the ridiculous common words that we use in first draft you know like mine's just everything's just mine is mine is well well i think as well yeah yeah no everything's just with me everything is just <laughs> uh, the number of justs that uh, that you know honestly i could lose 10 percent of the first draft just by removing the word just um and so things like that is very nice and i'm very and i also like weirdly i did so i ended up presenting a tv show so i kind of went full circle and i got in front of the camera as a writer i did this true crime two series of a true crime thing called written in blood which is now on itbx um where i present where basically wow. i talk i talk to um best selling authors about true crimes that had inspired various you know specific books and they talk talk to me through time um and i and that was and i that was fine as well i wasn't scared about that at all weird being the other side of the camera and kind of being i was very comfortable because i've you know i've been on shoots loads but never in front of the camera and um but it was yeah it was fine so i'm a yeah i'm a weird mix i think You're most weird. people are aren't they most I people i think most i think most people have come on here are so far being a, a mix Mm. And the ones who I thought of being an extrovert, they're like, no, 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 I'm an introvert. And I'm like, it's always in, it's always interesting. But the public speaking thing, I don't know what I was listening to um, a couple of days ago. I don't know if it was a podcast, and but the guy on the, let's say it was a podcast, said that they did a survey and asked people what they were most scared of. And public speaking came first and then death was second. So he said, he said, the thing is, if you're, if you're giving a eulogy at the funeral, you'd rather be the person in the coffin. Rather be in the box. The no, yeah. Uh, yeah, you see, I just don't, don't get that. No, I don't. I don't. I can't imagine you have any problem standing up in front of people. And no, I, no, no. Do you, do you like it though? Do you, positive, do you enjoy I, it? I mean, there's some moments when you say, like, oh my God, like you have to kind of psych yourself up to do it. But once I'm there, then I'm, I'm, I'm good with it. And I've always mm. had this notion in my head. It just goes back to university. You just need to get it done. Get it done, then it's over and you move on to the next thing. I don't build it up too much in my head to make it more than what it is. And I think that's what overwhelms people. They make it bigger than what it is. And then that's when the fear sits in. I think it's it's also fear of, I think, failing publicly, isn't it? Because you, yeah. you get up and it's the whole idea that you can say the wrong thing or dry or, you know, st- st- tell a terrible joke that falls flat or whatever <laughs> but like in most of the it doesn't really matter it, you know it's not like we're we're not like getting up on the o2 and doing an hour and a half stand up it's not that oh is god it? oh no i would definitely crash and burn at that <laughs> yeah exactly Who, like very few people could do that um and yeah. but you can but like getting up and for five minutes and or even 10 minutes and just talking about something I just sort of think, I would sort of think the thing about it is, is we do it all the time anyway. It's like, you know, we've had this conversation that's been going for over an hour now and it's like neither of us had a script and yet there's been no silence. It's all there. You know, you can do it. You just need to trust that you can do it. And as long as you sort of, there's got, as long as you've got a vague structure of like, oh, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to say this. I'm going to lead to this Mm. and I'm going to end on that. But you're fine, you're fine, aren't you? It's like yeah. I don't understand why people. Are, I honestly just don't understand why why people are so nervous about it. Well, they are. Even when I'm teaching uh, and I'm teaching advocacy, and at the beginning, when I, I teach a three day course, and at the beginning of the course, they are like trainee solicitors, and they they hate it. They don't want to be standing up there. They don't want to do any kind of public speaking. And I, and I literally throw them in at the deep end. I don't even do the introduction. I'm like, right, you're going to do a present, prepare a presentation, one minute on any any subject that you want. Just to yeah. throw them in there and just get yeah, it out yeah, of their yeah. system and stuff. But but normally by the end of the three days, there is some kind of, that's why I enjoy doing it, there is some mm. kind of transformation. But a lot of it is they just don't want to be up there. And I think it's the thing of being seen also. It's being seen and sort of the chance that you're going to make a fool of yourself, isn't it? It's yeah. like, oh, I'm going to say something stupid or I'm going to, you know, fall over or whatever. I'm going to have food <laughs> down me or something. And But actually it's like, mm. it's just kind of, yeah, you just need to get out of the way of yourself. But that's the same, that's the same with, loads of things isn't it yeah if you're you're too much in your head you just stop yourself from doing it and if you just get on with it then it's much better most definitely so um moving on from that what challenge or experience in your life shaped you the most um i think i think it's sort of ongoing isn't it i I think Mm. what i well, I, I don't. I can't think. This is sort of like one major thing. I sort of haven't. I've had a pretty, you know, easy, nice, 
kind of lower middle class working <laughs> slash lower middle class like background university educated i'm a white middle-aged man i mean what have i got to worry about like what challenges have you're just I taking all those you know what i mean boxes. it's like i'm not you know i like to check my own privilege it's sort of i, I sort of i haven't got there's not been any major things in my past that that, yeah. have, that i've had to overcome but i just think in terms of i think you know and i i think i definitely think creatively you do need to kind of in order to keep yourself honest and in order to keep yourself interested, I think, is you do need to kind of just do things that are that you're not quite sure you can do. Is to create right. your own challenges, really. Um, is that feel, feel the fair and do it anyway sort of mentality? Yeah, well, like, you know, like I, I'd hit the age of 40 and never written a novel and thought, I'm going to do it. I'm going to have a go and and see what happens. Um, and and like now, I, I sort of, I'm kind of going back to sort of full circle a bit as well so like i've written a pilot episode of the of solomon creed um because it was in development for a bit and and i could tell it was sort of coming to the end of its period and i just thought well mm-hmm. you know well i'm just i'm just gonna write a pilot the writer who was supposed to writing it either was or they didn't like it or whatever it was so i did that and i, I that was good that was an interesting new discipline um and I, you know, and I went back to TV, um, you know, not because I needed to, um, because I could, you know, quite happily fill my time writing the books, um, but because I sort of, a, I missed it. I'm, you know, I know, I kind of, you know, it's quite solitary writing a book, and despite my yeah. introvertness, um, I, I, I kind of, I quite like the collective being endeavor of TV, being mm-hmm. with other people, and it's not just down to you. It's quite nice doing that. Um, and also, you know, I spent a long time getting very good in the edit at um, putting together things and writing things. And I, and all of a sudden, I wasn't using that skill. And it's sort of, it's a bit, I kind of missed it. And so I quite like, so now I, so I've been, I'm the head writer on a show called um, uh, Saving Lives at Sea, which is BBC2, the RNLI show, you know, where they basically right. just retell the stories of these amazing yeah. rescues that the RNLI do. And I've been doing that now sort of in parallel to writing the books for the last four or five years and it's great because it uses a different part of your head it's different storytelling mm-hmm. you know because it's when you're writing a, a, a commentary script you're linking together bits of interviews which is a bit like you you know i go through interviews transcripts of interviews and just pick out the bits that tell the yeah. story and bounce talking heads around and and do a bit of commentary that links bits that they don't do very well or explain something quickly and you know it's you know i like doing that um so yeah, so I just I kind of I sort of I'm I, I'm continually trying to define myself by creating new challenges for myself. I think that's what I'm doing, but I haven't no I haven't got any big. And then I woke up and I was blind, and they said I'd never <laughs> see again, and I said no, <laughs> and I I walked. <laughs> This is all very religious. It's like a Lazarus no, moment. No, no, well, yeah, it all goes back to the, yeah, Sanctus. No, I know, but that's, I always sort of feel a bit of a fraud because, you know, sometimes you go to these things and people go, oh, you know, they tell their stories and you're like, oh, my God, you know, you I've got nothing. overcame so much. And I've got literally, yeah, i got nothing. I was nothing never hungry. There. I was never homeless. No one close to me ever died. It was like, you know. What have I got? I, um, yeah, no, I got nothing. I shouldn't even be here. I don't feel like a fraud. <laughs> okay, so the next question is, if you could go back to when you were 25 years old and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? Well, apart from the obvious of, you know, buy, buy property in London <laughs> or look out for Bitcoin, um, it would be, uh, presumably you're talking about, are you talking about writing things? No, or anything, just general life anything. Ex- General um, general life, but I like the um, buy property and buy look out for Bitcoin. <laughs> just that. I mean, surely that's the that's the best, isn't it? Everything else, can, I think you know, it is the best. Figure it out. <laughs> just that. I tell myself if I like if I've got like ten seconds, I'd go listen. Bitcoin <laughs> buy property in London. That's it. Trust me. And it's, and it's property anywhere in London. Like just anywhere, be, or just property. Just property. About yeah. It. yeah, yeah, exactly. Don't worry. Don't overthink it. Don't think, oh, is that <laughs> going to be gentrified? Is that a cool area? It's like, it doesn't matter. Just have it. <laughs> um, yeah, so that would be my advice I gave to my 25-year-old self. Okay. I, so- unfortunately, my 25-year-old self probably won't listen. My 25-year-old See- self would go, what? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> But this is why I always ask, because I think most questions, they'll, they'll always say, oh, what would you tell your 15-year-old self or your 18-year-old self? And I know my 15 and 18-year-old self will not listen to anybody. 
Yeah, no, it exactly. was very stubborn. I think 25, you know, you kind of trying, you kind of worked out your way a little bit in the world. You've experienced some kind of life, especially working life. So I think 25 years old, you're more likely to listen a little bit. Maybe not much. Probably, do you know, I'd probably tell myself to start writing books quicker because I think when I started writing, I was like, why well, I should have done this earlier. Yeah. You know, and so my first, my first book was published when I was 41. And, um, and I reckon I could have, I kind of now feel like, oh God, you know, I, I should have started earlier. And you sort of see these people like, who are, you know, like you Stephen the- King and whatever, who started when he was 23 or four or whatever. And you just think, oh God, you know, I'm so behind. I'm never going to catch up with some of these people. Oh, you see the Observer, don't they do it like every beginning of the year? It's like the top writers, debut writers under 30 or something like that they do. And you're just like, oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I think, I think yeah I think 25 I think I needed probably I could have started in my 30s I think I'd done enough by then that I had something interesting to say I had a point of view I think by then I think in my in mm. my mid-20s probably still not yeah and if I'd written something it would have been probably a bit sort of bit a bit cringy I would have thought <laughs> I probably would have thought I knew more than I did and it would have shown I don't think I was deep I was enough say, a, bit, a bit self-serving um, yeah a little bit a bit navel gazing <laughs> Okay, and finally, Simon Twan, can I just say I've enjoyed this conversation very, very much. So have I. It's been great. <laughs> it been has. Chat. It has. So finally, where can listeners find you online? Uh, well, I, as because I'm old, uh, I'm on Facebook, <laughs> um, and because uh, and also Twitter. But who knows how long that ship's going to stay afloat? I mean, geez, what is going on with that? Every day, it's just like, oh, it's still here. <laughs> I know it's just weird. And I, you go it's on it, and like I, uh, you get the thing. It's like I don't know who any of these people are whose tweets I'm being shown. Like literally, no. any of them. And the, I know we're going off topic, and the engagement is really, really low. Like I know, really like, low. I'll... Whereas before, I used to get like, I say, hundreds of people, you know, liking and retweeting. Now, if you get six, it's a good day. I know. It's like it's it's like shouting into the the abyss now. Yeah, I said it, it. I called it shouting down the toilet. <laughs> It, that's what, yeah, that's exactly that's what it's like. It's not even the abyss. That's I'm I'm kind of you know making it. I'm I'm, I'm sort of flattering it with calling it the abyss. Um, and where else? Uh, well, I've got a web a web page, SimonToyne.net. Uh, basically, there aren't many Simon Toyne's around. So if you Google Simon Toyne, you'll find all we'll of find the, you. all of my all of my. Um, there's me and there's a there's a musical director called Simon Toyne. So I'm I'm not him. I'm the other one. You're the other Simon Toyne. The well, Simon Toyne. The other Simon Toyne, thank you for being part of the conversation. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining me for this episode of The Conversation. I'll be back next Tuesday with a new episode. Make sure that you subscribe so that you don't miss out on the next episode or any bonus episodes. And it would mean a lot if you took a minute to leave a review. You can follow me on social media. My links are on my website, nadinematheson.com. And if you'd like to be a guest on a future episode, email the conversation at nadinematheson.com. See you soon.